Hey guys, Will here from PyTop and welcome to the first video in our short series on 3D printing. So, you've heard the term 3D printing and you might know a little bit about it, but we're going to be working on the assumption that you're totally new to it. So, what is it and why do people do it? Well, let's say you've designed something on your computer in CAD, that's computer-aided design software, to solve a problem you've got, or because you're designing a product that you want to sell. You've got a nice model of it, lots of details, looks good, but how do you get that design from the virtual world into the real world? Well, you've got a couple of options, but until pretty recently, most of these options were time-consuming, expensive, and required a whole bunch of specialist skills. You might have given your design to a prototyping company, experts in making one-off and specialist items, and they would have gone away and measured and cut and assembled all the pieces together and then sent you the finished product a few weeks later. The amount of work involved means usually that process isn't cheap. With the advancement of technology, there's now a bunch of ways to automatically turn a digital design into a real one. And two of the big categories are additive manufacturing and subtractive manufacturing. As the name suggests, with subtractive manufacturing, you'll start with a block of raw material like aluminium or aluminum for our friends across the pond, and you'll cut away or subtract material until what you've got left is in the shape of what you want. This is how companies like Apple, for example, build the chassis for their very expensive laptops. It's a very precisely controlled process. Usually, this kind of work is known as CNC milling or rooting or drilling, and it looks a bit like this that you're seeing here. But the incredible precision of modern day machines means that tools can now be made incredibly complex in precise ways, allowing for something like this five axis computer controlled CNC machine from this Japanese company. CNC routing is often expensive though, and a part of the reason for that is the nature of this subtractive process, which means you start with a lot more raw material than you actually need, and a huge amount of it is wasted as it gets cut away. Enter additive manufacturing. As you might have guessed, with additive manufacturing you start with nothing and you keep drawing from a reserve of raw material like this reel of filament and add in bits of material until you've got what you want. There are a few ways this can be done, but of course the one we care about here is 3D printing. There are a lot of different types of 3D printers in the world. I have five different types right here in my workshop, but they pretty much all operate on the same basic principle. You start with nothing and you build up the thing you want to construct in very thin slices called layers. This is no different to, for example, building a wall of Lego, but each layer is only typically 100 microns thick. It's about one-tenth of a millimeter. Now with the arrival of 3D printing, engineers and designers and artists and teachers and hobbyists, basically anyone, can turn a digital design into a real-life object without needing to be an expert. Mechanical engineers designing parts for manufacturing might use a 3D printer to first create a quick, low-quality version of their part to check that it looks the way they expect it to. Artists might use a 3D printer to easily create complex structures that might otherwise have been impossible to create using traditional manufacturing methods. And astronauts on the International Space Station have a 3D printer that they can use to build replacement parts in space, something that would have been pretty impossible just a decade or two ago. And from the comfort of your home or school, you can imagine something crazy, design it on your computer, and then press a button and watch it materialize before your eyes. 3D printing is one of those rare and wonderful things that really makes you feel like you're living in the future. So let's talk about a few different types of 3D printer technologies that are out there. 3D printing can be carried out in very different ways and each variant puts a different weight on speed and quality and cost. And it's outside the scope of this video to cover them all in detail. But the main ones that we're going to cover here are FFF, aka FDM, SLA, DLP, and SLS. Welcome to the exciting world of 3D printer acronyms. Now by far the most popular version found in homes and schools is FDM, or Fused Deposition Modeling, which you might also hear referred to as FFF, or Fused Filament Fabrication. In this case, the printer takes a raw plastic material or filament from a reel, heats it up to about 220 Celsius or 430 Fahrenheit, and melts or fuses it into consecutive layers in the printing area, also known as the print bed. FDM printers are cheap to run and can be very cheap to buy. They can use a large range of different plastics, we'll talk more about that a little bit later, and whilst they're a great place for beginners to start, professionals also often use them because they're an affordable and easy way to create rapid prototypes. Now next up is my personal favourite, SLA or Stereolithographic Printers. SLA printers work by submerging the print bed in a UV curable polymer, basically a sticky resin that's sensitive to light. 
a powerful UV laser then rapidly and precisely draws out each layer onto the submerged print bed, hardening or curing the resin at each point that it shines on. It works in exactly the same layer by layer method as the FDM printers, but the whole process takes place upside down with the printed model rising out of a bath of liquid resin. Whilst this technology is generally slower than FDM, SLA printers are capable of outstanding levels of precision and finished prints can be exquisitely detailed and smooth to touch. The high price means that this type of printer is less common in homes or schools, but many professional designers rely on SLA printers for extremely faithful reproductions of detailed digital models that they've designed. They're also strangely popular with dentists. And finally, another different form of 3D printing is Selective Laser Sintering, or SLS, which also works by using a laser but this time it shines it onto a bed of raw powdered material. The laser, again working on uh, one layer at a time, selectively targets and heats up specific areas, causing the particles at each area to heat up and fuse together to form a solid layer. When that's done, a roller puts a fresh coat of powder on top of the completed layer, ready to begin the next one. Because of the use of powder here, instead of resin or plastic filament, SLS printers can actually print metal objects as well as plastic ones, which is pretty exciting. It's very expensive though. How much does it cost? Well, in the US about $800 per pound, so about 10 pound part would cost maybe $8,000. Technologies like this allow the 3D printer to be used not only for quickly testing something, but can actually be used to make production grade parts, things that actually get used in the real world. To make car parts, for example. And this technology continues to mature and get cheaper all the time, and it's completely changing the way the manufacturing world operates. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves here, so let's get back to FDM printers and how you can get started at home. So, as I mentioned earlier, all FDM printers use a reel of plastic filament to pull in raw material, melt it, and print it into an object. Now the plastic in this filament started life in the form of many little plastic pellets or nurdles, and to turn it into this convenient 3D printer friendly filament reel, those plastic pellets have been heated up and extruded or drawn out into a long thin string of plastic with a very precise diameter. In the case of this one it's 1.75 millimeters. And then it's been wound around this drum and you load this drum into your 3D printer and it slowly takes in filament as it needs it, it melts it and it prints it. So what types of plastic do we use with our FDM 3D printer? Well, first up is PLA or polylactic acid. PLA is by far the most commonly used material for beginners. It's cheap, it's reasonably strong, it's easy to print with, and as an added bonus, PLA is partially made from organic elements like corn and sugarcane. Another very commonly used plastic is acrylonitrile butadiene sterine, but don't worry, everybody just calls it ABS. ABS is more commonly found in industrial settings as it creates stronger, harder wearing parts than PLA, and whilst they're both thermoplastics, ABS can withstand higher temperatures before melting, which can be useful, but it also means that higher temperatures are needed to print it in the first place, and not all 3D printers support those temperatures. Now another plastic that you may have heard of is nylon, which is used in loads of everyday things. What makes nylon so special is that it's really tough and hard wearing, but it's also slightly flexible, so you can find it in seat belts and strong ropes, dental floss and clothing, and my personal favorite, cable ties because they are the solution to all of life's problems. And there's another family of flexible plastic known as thermoplastic elastomers or TPE. These are much more rubbery than nylon so you might use them to print tires or even running shoes. Obviously this has a lot of advantages. Rubber is awesome and being able to 3D print it into any shape is awesome. -er. But the downside is that TPE and nylon and PETG can all be a bit trickier to print with than PLA. So you might want to wait until you've got a bit of experience with PLA under your belt before trying out these more advanced materials. Now that's by no means all the filaments in the world, there are a bunch more types. Some can be dissolved in water and others are infused with fibres or powders of wood or metal or even carbon fibre to enhance some of their mechanical properties or appearance. These advanced materials are something to look forward to when your training wheels come off. Ok that wraps it up for this video and we've now covered all the important basics of 3D printing. We're just getting started though, so in the next video we'll roll up our sleeves and we'll get to work on how you can make your first 3D print.